but we do have Kate and David back with me. So, Kate, this reporting from your colleagues doesn't square with what you are hearing, and why would prosecutors want Pecker to go first? Yes, Alex, certainly the New York Times is hearing that David Pecker may be the first witness that is to be called, and he is the former publisher of the National Enquirer. And certainly, I think if, if this is the case and he is the first witness that prosecutors choose to put on the stand, it really shows how they plan to approach this case and present it in front of the jury. Um, David Pecker, as the publisher of the National Enquirer and as a close friend of uh, then-candidate Trump back in 2016, was part of this scheme to suppress negative stories about Trump. And for some of them, the concept of catch and kill both gets get these negative stories and try to suppress them so the general public wouldn't hear. And I think if he is ultimately the first witness, this is the prosecutor saying, we want to put this, this witness up, have him explain to the jury this whole scheme that was being concocted back in 2016 that ultimately created what then becomes this hush money payment and uh, what prosecutors say was the scheme to affect the outcome of the 2016 election. Yeah, and he allegedly uh, helped to create the payments for both Karen McDougal and Stormy Daniels. So the question is, do we actually get to a first witness tomorrow, Kate? Do you think opening statements will go quickly enough? I don't think we have any indication about the timing specifically of how how long each side is getting for opening statements, but it's possible that we do we do go quickly. I think if, if we have seen anything in, in Justice Juan Mershon's uh, attempts to keep this trial under control, we got a jury in three days, and I think he is he is dead set to get this case done in the six week time frame that he's mm -hmm. put forward. We also are breaking early tomorrow for the Passover holiday. So it's it's possible we do get to the first witness, but I guess we'll, we'll see for real tomorrow. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, David, just just to drill down on opening statements, prosecutors say this case is about the rule of law and whether or not Donald Trump broke it. All told, his allies struck three hush money deals paying off people who had stories to tell, stories that could have derailed Trump's 2016 candidacy. The Times says directly linking Trump to the plot to falsify records is another matter altogether. His lawyers will likely argue he was oblivious and that Michael Cohen handled specifics. But David... Is it really difficult to prove this case? Would a jury believe that Cohen randomly decided to dip into his home equity to give money to Stormy Daniels? Alex, I don't think it's difficult to prove this case legally. And here's part of the reason why I say this. The rule for the prosecution's office, any prosecution's office, is you don't bring a high-profile case that you expect to lose. However many mm. lawyers that we think Al Bragg has showed this to, he showed it to at least two times that number, and they've all assured him, legally, you can prove this case. The big concern is whether or not the jury gets distracted when they're hearing this evidence. And that's a huge lift for the prosecution in opening statement tomorrow, because they really need to play this straight. This links into what you and I were talking about in the last segment about prior bad acts coming up mm -hmm. against former President Trump. You've got two lawyers and an engineer on your jury. I don't know any trial lawyer who would voluntarily leave one lawyer on their jury panel, let alone two plus an engineer. The reason that matters is because they're the rare exception in terms of jurors who are going to focus more on evidence than arguments. Therefore, you don't want to be too salacious in your opening statement. You want to play it straight and let them know hmm. he did it. We're going to prove it. Here are the facts you should expect to hear during the course of the trial. And you leave it to the defense to make things dramatic so that you can say they brought this up and we just had to respond to it. Wow, that sounds like very smart analysis. I think you're definitely right there. Kate, uh, Tuesday, the attention shifts to a contempt motion on Trump's alleged violations of the gag order. Prosecutors claim Trump violated the order uh, about 10 times. And you've been writing about this question. Will Trump go to prison if he is convicted? Is this a realistic threat facing Donald Trump? I mean, what are the odds? Well, again, as the New York Times has reported, Justice Mershon is certainly a no-nonsense jurist, and he also has a reputation for being being tough on white-collar crime. So it is a possibility that ultimately, if he is convicted of even a count of the 34 counts of falsify, felony falsifying business records, that he could be sent to prison. I mean, as an e-felony, this, um, this crime could carry up to four years incarceration. Now, it's certainly likely that he would run these all concurrently if he's convicted of multiple counts rather than consecutively adding them up. Um, but it is a possibility. Now, it's also possible that 
ultimately, if he is convicted, that uh, Mr. Trump faces probation. Right now, we just don't know. And it's certainly something that I'm sure throughout the course of the evidence and, and ultimately once a verdict is reached that Justice Mershon would be evaluating. David, do you foresee any judge throwing Trump in prison? No, Alex, I don't think there's any chance. And here's part of the reason why there are things that affect how the criminal justice system operates that we just never really talk about. One of the main features is the facility that you go to has a big decision to play in determining how you actually serve your time. Years ago, if you recall, Paris Hilton had a DWI. The judge kept sentencing her. She'd go to the facility and she'd get let out of jail early and people would be wondering what's going on. And what happens is what any jailer, what any warden is going to say is, look, I don't want him in my facility because I can't keep him safe. And y'all know that. So do not send him here. So is there a possibility he gets sentenced to some time? Sure. I think it's very remote, but the likelihood of him actually ever sitting inside of a jail cell, I think, is virtually non-existent for that reason. Hmm. Okay. Um, I'm curious, Kate, is there buzz around the courthouse about Stormy Daniels? And how do you see both the upside and the potential peril of the prosecution putting her on the stand? I don't know that there's a, a ton of conversation. I think the reporters around the courthouse are certainly talking about the possibility that certainly that she would come for part of the proceedings or potentially be called as a witness. And I, I think that ultimately the prosecutors are probably making the calculus of is, is her testimony going to be more of a um, is it even necessary? Because are there other witnesses that are going to be able to fill in the gaps of this hush money deal without her taking the stand? And so I'm sure there's certainly she, I think, was prepared to go and testify. But I'm sure that the prosecutors are trying to decide, is that even needed or is that going to create more of kind of a, a sideshow that's that's unnecessary to present to the jury? OK, we shall see. Kate Kristovec and Dave Anderson, thank you guys so much. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on Get or the Cloud icon and enjoy it.